Okay, so we've been talking about solute transport, and we end up with a solution for an instantaneous injection of material in an infinitely long column. So I've got a column of sand here, and I'm going to put in an injection at time equals zero. And what's going to happen is this region of, of material, let's suppose that the, that the water's moving this way, it'll spread out. Okay? But it's going to still be more concentrated in the middle, less concentrated at either end of the plume. Okay. Now, this solute moves at a velocity u, okay? And so when we look at the solution, we see that, yes, the peak concentration, since this is negative, the peak concentration happens when this term is zero. So this is, as this is, since this is a positive number, this is a positive number, but there's a negative sign there. As this gets bigger, everything else gets smaller. And so the peak concentration happens when x equals ut. So that's a translating wave of contaminant moving down through the column. This form, the x minus ut squared, is a Gaussian curve. or a bell curve. Okay, so we know that that is what's called the normal distribution, and so it's gonna have a nice little form like that. This is gonna be at the, at the, um, the center of mass. And then it spreads out either way symmetrically in space. So we're drawing x in this way, okay? So x only shows up here, and so as I go smaller and larger, since this is squared, it's symmetrical. It gets squared, so it has exactly the same value, and it has a classic Gaussian curve. Now, the thing that I want you to think about, though, is very rarely do we get to actually watch a plume moving through soil. What we typically will do is we'll put in a sampling point. There's our sampling point. So what we're actually going to do is watch in time the plume come by. Now let's look at time. Time shows up here as we saw before like x. So it's, it, in a sense you think it'd be symmetrical, but time also shows up here and here. So as time goes on, this number gets bigger, so that reduces the size of this, and this number gets bigger, which reduces the size here, and so, and we also will talk about degradation in a moment. This is a degradation, we're not gonna deal with degradation quite yet. So what happens in time is that the curve will start off abruptly high, and then it'll go out and tail off. So when we do time as our axis, what we see is that it's steeper as we first start seeing the plume, but then as this plume keeps on spreading as it's going by, it has a longer tail. And so what I want you to really take from this is the fact that watching in space and watching in time give fundamentally different shapes. And this, which we call the breakthrough curve, the breakthrough curve is watching in time. That's by far the most common thing to have, and it will always have an extended tail, regardless of if there are other processes or not that might spread um, the solute further even in an idealized case, it will have this extended tail in time, but not in space. So we have our solution to the advection dispersion equation, and we've talked about the fact that it's a Gaussian form, but one of the things we haven't talked about yet is the impact of sorption. So we see this 
are showing up over and over again. In fact, it shows up in exactly three places. The R is called the retardation of a plume. And this is only going to find this form when we have what's called linear absorption. And what that means is that the absorbed concentration versus the liquid phase is going to have a linear relationship. So there is a constant so that this, the concentration on the solid phase is equal to some coefficient times the concentration in the liquid phase. This description, absorption, is very accurate for low concentrations. Why is that? Basically, we have a solid here I'll draw, and it has these absorption sites. And so there are many, many places that are chemically reactive where our solute might absorb. Now, what happens is, when there's low concentration, maybe one of them gets a, a solute uh, stuck to it, but that leaves all the rest of them open. So having one site occupied does not greatly change the probability that any other solute molecule might also absorb. On the other hand, if we had many, many, many of these sites occupied um, with absorbed uh, compounds, then we'd say, what is the probability that another solute would have a place to bind? And it becomes very low. So it, it, when all of these are filled up, then you would have no absorption. So what we see then is that linear absorption, where there's only a few sites, then the probability of new absorption is, 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 is held constant. But as we get a higher concentration, in fact, this curve goes to a maximum, which is the total, we can use a Q typically, is the total absorption capacity of that material. So when we're at the low concentration end, then we can work with this concept of retardation and we can think about it as a linear process. This is very important because when it goes to the nonlinear stage, then all of the mathematics behind this changes drastically, and this idea of retardation is no longer suitable. Supposing we do have linear absorption, what we see, which is really, really cool, is that the R here, there's one more R, the R universally is found with the T. Again, setting aside degradation for the moment, but in, the, in this part of the equation, it's always T over R, T over R, T over R. So all of the time is adjusted by the retardation factor, which means that for the plume, if with no retardation, the plume took T equals, let's say, one hour to get here, and if the retardation factor were equal to four, then for the retarded plume to get to the exact same place, would take T equals four hours. So the retardation really does just slow down the movement of the compound, and it's very predictable. And the other thing you'll see is that R here means that as retardation gets larger, the concentration in the liquid phase is smaller. And so it reduces the amount of, and because, of course, uh, uh, four times as much now here is absorbed to the solid than is in the liquid phase. So the, the concentration follows the exact same pattern, the geometry is the same, but it'll have a lower concentration and it'll move more slowly. And that's why we call it the retardation factor. And that linear description of, of how solutes move in, in, in soils is a very, very handy description and it's useful for many compounds which are important at low concentrations. So, Again, looking at the advection dispersive equation, we've talked about retardation, which has to do with absorption. We've talked about how the plumes spread in time and space. 
But what is this last term here? And this is what we'll call the degradation term. The degradation term is, in this case, using what's called linear degradation, which means that the change in concentration in time is equal to a coefficient times the concentration itself. This is a linear degradation. And you may recognize this from radioactive decay, for example. Radioactive decay, the amount of decay is proportional to the amount of radiation. So it's always losing a constant fraction of its, of its mass in a given amount of time. It's a very convenient form of, of, of a degradation because if we double the concentration, the this, this same solution will apply. So in other words, it's a linear, if you double C here, you can double C there and it still will solve the same equation. So it's, whereas, for example, if I had C squared, that would not be a linear equation. If I doubled the concentration, we'd get a completely different solution. So we're using a very, very special case of a linear, uh, a linear absorption here, a linear degradation. And what it gives rise to, the unique solution to this particular differential equation is an exponential, and it has a decay constant times time, okay? Now, uh, what that means is that the decay process doesn't change the geometry of the plume at all. So basically, if we had, and we're gonna, we'll draw um, space here, so this is a plume moving along, and this will be concentration here. And so we'll take a snapshot, and let's suppose that that was our, our nice little Gaussian plume in space. And so if we had degradation, what it would say is that the degraded plume is just a linear multiplier of that concentration. At an earlier time, when it was just, it may have been that the concentration was quite a bit higher, and similarly, the degraded plume would be a constant multiplier. And so this description of concentration in time and space under the influence of degradation actually gives rise to very, very simple um, uh, mathematics where you can add multiple plumes and you can simply track the shape of the plume and account for the degradation by simply multiplying it by a rate of degradation. Notice that I should have drawn this one a little higher. Why? because it hasn't been exposed to degradation as long. So this degradation multiplier is getting more and more influential as time goes on. So our undegraded plume might be higher, but our degraded plume might be very, very low. So that's the simplest way to describe degradation. What we've pointed out is oh, we've always used linear descriptors, linear retardation, linear absorption, linear degradation. And that allows us to do the most important thing, which is superposition. We can superimpose solutions because if we double the concentration, it, it, it's still a solution. If we, any new solution added to an old solution is also a solution. So this idea of superposition is one of the key positive outcomes of using a linear degradation and a linear absorption model. Even though those models sacrifice certain flexibility in terms of describing real world degradation and real world absorption, in some sense, the added simplicity of being able to write one equation to describe the entire movement is far more important than having the, the, the precision afforded by more complex descriptions. Now that is true in many cases, of course, there are going to be cases where you have to go to nonlinear degradation, nonlinear absorption, and more complex descriptions of transport. But from the idea of capturing the fundamental processes, this solution illustrates the fundamental behaviors of contaminant transport in soils.